Hey, this is Nika Monford, a.k.a. Tech Savvy Diva. Yo, this is Terrence Gaines, a.k.a. Brother Tech. And you are listening and or watching the Snob West Show, where we talk all things Apple and then some. Welcome all to our regular show, and thank you for tuning in. Before we get started with the show, we want to take a moment to thank all of our Patreons. Um... If you too want to become a patron, you can subscribe for as little as $5 a month. And what that $5 will get you will be access to our pre-show content, which is exclusive content that we don't discuss on the main show. Um, You get access to um, our live taping and you also get access for now to our Discord chat. Um, Again, we'll likely be moving to a Facebook group come the top of the year. Um, We don't have any new snobbers this weekend. That's what we call our Patreons. Um, So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the lowdown where we talk all things Apple. Now, if you were on the pre-show as one of our patrons, you would have gotten Brother Tech's full first impressions on the next two things that we're going to talk about, but we will start with just the highlights. Um, The AirPod Max um, that we talked about last week, they have shipped. Um, If you look at Brother Tech, you will see that he has on his new um, AirPods Max flex on them a little bit he got them (laughs) on the 15th that was the first date that they were available um physically that is um if you want them it's a bit of a wait list now and also the apple fitness plus was just released um so there are a couple of um os um, updates that you need to be able to use fitness plus and uh, AirPod Max. So for iOS, you need version 14.3. For watch OS, you need 7.2. TV OS, for 14, you need 14.3. And you also need to be running on your Mac. If you plan to use any of these items on your Mac, you need to be running Big Sur 11.1. One, is there anything you want to tell the people or are you keeping that solely on the Patreon? Well, I'm going to do both. Okay. Uh, Like Nika said, uh, if you want to get my first impressions, you got to be a Patreon member so you can hear what I think, how they sound, how they compare to the AirPods Pro, how they compare to some of the competitors like Sony and Bose. You're not going to get any of that. But what I will tell you is the integration that goes into with the AirPod Max and Apple Fitness Plus, I think Apple is on the right page and you can kind of see the benefits of being in the ecosystem, right? Because, you know, being in the ecosystem is kind of a knock, you know, it's kind of a, 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 a thing that people use to kind of make fun of Apple people. Oh, you got all those Apple devices. You you must be a sheep or you must be, you know, whatever. You're a but, right, exactly. <laughs> but now that uh, Apple is rolling out more products and services that all work together, you know, specifically, you know, if you've got headphones, if you've got mobile devices, if you've got, you know, desktop or laptop computer, if you've got tablets entertainment device you know it all works together so you know just to reemphasize, uh all of these updates for the most part are primarily you know connected to being able to listen to like the noise cancellation and the adaptive sound for the airpod max you know being able to use apple fitness plus on your watch on your phone on your tablet and on apple tv you know there are some other benefits with these updates but primarily it's because apple fitness plus and the airpods max dropped this week so if you are interested in both or any of those products you know definitely go out and get these updates you know so you can take advantage uh and we'll kind of talk about you know specifically apple fitness plus you know and and, you know probably next up for the next store okay for the next thing we have coming up 
is that, um, again, as we just mentioned, the Apple Fitness Plus has finally released. Um, if you remember, it was announced back during, I believe, the September announcement um, that this new um, fitness service um, that is expected to rival Peloton um, is is out. So um, we have a, a story that we are looking at from The Verge and it gives you um, a little bit of a rundown. We've talked about it before, um, but this gives a little bit more detail since it's now actually out. Uh, the first thing is if you are interested in the, um, in the, in the service, you can get a one month free trial. And if you recently bought, um, what is it? The Apple watch six S E or three, you get an additional three months free. Um, you are the fitness app, the fitness plus plus expert of the two of us. So anything you want to, I guess, give the, give the people. Um, so one of the things that I noticed was, well, one of the things that Apple mentioned was you have to have an Apple watch in order to use Apple fitness plus because they want to, they want you to track your, your vitals, your heart rate, your pace, you know, whether you're running a treadmill, whatever equipment you're running, you know, they have an associate, uh, associated, you know, uh, vital for that because they, you use those vitals to actually display on your screen while you're working out. So if you have an iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, you see your vitals live on that screen. So you're not necessarily switching to look at your watch when you're supposed to be focused on the workout, especially if you're doing something like exercise, uh, um, rowing, which is what I use when you're rowing, you, you, you can't look at nothing. You got to be focused on <laughs> the whole movement, right? Same thing with, you know, if you're doing a treadmill, you know, there are some people, you know, the pros, you know, who can run full speed and look at their watch. But if you've got a screen in front of you, you need your Apple Watch connected to Apple Fitness Plus so you can see that on screen display so you're not distracted while you work out. Right. So but uh, one of the things I noticed when I started an Apple Fitness Plus workout, um, it took a little bit longer than normal to do that first connection between my phone and my watch in the Fitness Plus app. So it brought up a message that said, start workout without Apple Watch. So it sounds huh. like you may not necessarily need it won't kick you out. Let me rephrase. It won't kick you out if you don't have an Apple Watch. But probably to but get you started, get you have to have it. Right. Right. Uh, you can probably get started, but you won't see you won't get any of benefits of tracking your uh, your fitness while you're while you're doing the workout. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, of course, it goes with the on screen thing, you know, because when. The workout trainers, they, they will give you cues, you know, check out your vitals, you know, make sure, check your pace. You know, we're doing whatever many pay, minutes, a mile, whatever the case may be. Once they do that cue, your vitals on the screen will change because it's connected to your Apple Watch. You mm. won't get that if you don't have your Apple Watch. So as even though you may not need it to get the benefits go ahead and have one. So at, again, it requires the Apple watch, but you don't necessarily need mm. it in order to, you know, do the workouts. So but to get the full experience, that, like, you need the, exactly. the watch. Exactly. And, you know, once you got everything set up, like for instance, uh, me and my wife will probably both use Apple fitness plus the cool thing about having a watch is uh, if I need to do my workout on the Apple TV, and my wife is logged in, I can take my watch and go up to my Apple TV and with the, you know, I think it's near, I think they use NFC or mm -hmm. maybe Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, whatever. Something. <laughs> I can I can actually, yeah, right. I can actually use my watch, hold it up to my Apple TV. It recognizes me, switches over to my profile, brings up all my stats, brings up my profile, brings up all my preferred workouts. And then I can go work out and my wife comes down, she puts her watch over it and then it switches. So that's one of the benefits of having an Apple watch with Apple Fitness Plus, because you can do that switching if you're a multifamily uh, household. And then other than that, I mean, the workouts are seamless. Like I mentioned in the pre-show, you can go from your iPhone to your iPad 
to your Apple TV all in like one session. Of course, not with the same workout. But if you switch from workout to workout, like if I'm I give you, you know, I, I can only use myself for an example. But if I'm doing the rowing machine, I need my iPhone on this on the front where I connected to my rowing machine. Mm-hmm. But when I'm doing yoga or when I'm doing hit, I want to do that on Apple TV because it's a bigger, bigger screen, screen and I'm sitting right, right. So I can go from doing a rowing workout done with that automatically go to the Apple TV, put my watch on the Apple TV, it recognizes me, then I can use the Apple TV remote to find the other workout and then keep it going. It's all tracked back to the Apple Watch. So when you're done, you click start and stop on the watch and then that's how you get to track and close those rings. So nice. all that to say, again, the, the, the Apple ecosystem is filling out and you can definitely now start to see the benefit of being all the way in because if you're halfway out it's not the same <laughs> <laughs> all right so um as i mentioned uh you can get a one month trial um if you have recently purchased one of the three newer um watch devices you can get it the trial for three months and after that if you just do the fitness plus standalone it's 9.99 a month um, we mentioned last week that you can get you can be a part of the um the pretty much the bundle is it apple right. one i think yeah, yeah apple one that's the name of it. um you know you can get a bundle with um, some other features as well if you need it um if mm-hmm. i get it which i probably will i will do the single uh you know service since i don't really need all of the the bundle stuff so right all right, so let's move on to the next thing. Um, for those of us who who use Chromecast, well, those of you who use Chromecast, I think I have a couple, but I don't really use them. Um, the Apple TV app is going to be rolling out with the new Chromecast um, device. You know, the little dongle you plug into the back of the TV to essentially make your TV uh, your standard TV, a smart TV. So um, it's interesting to see that um, Google is now integrating their Chromecast. It's called the new device is called Chromecast with Google TV. So those users will now be able to access their Apple TV Plus um, with a subscription in addition to their other Apple um, content and purchases. So um, yeah, like buying movies buying movies mm-hmm. and renting movies from Apple TV that will now be available on this Chromecast dongle. Yeah. And so Apple and Google um, have been partnering up on a couple of things. This is the second official partnership between the two tech giants. So um, interesting. It is going to be interesting to see if there's anything else. And you are the big uh, home automation guy, right? So, um, it looks like, um, I'm trying to determine, is it saying that you'll be able to, um, have, uh, what Apple music, uh, on the, on the nest devices that are in the Google home automation, smart home type of things. Yeah. So, you know, Apple music is a subscription. Apple TV Plus is a subscription. Mm-hmm. They want people to subscribe. Ideally, they want you to subscribe on their devices. But if you don't have their devices, you know, they know a lot of people have Android devices. Apple Music is a subscription service that Android users, or I guess more specifically, Samsung Galaxy users, can actually subscribe to Apple Music from their Android device. So this makes sense that they would offer you know, Apple Music rolling out to the, you know, smart speaker things in the Google Nest and the, you know, Nest Audio or whatever they call it. Um, And also, again, that Apple TV and Apple TV Plus will roll out to the Chromecast uh, dongles. I like this, and I'll tell you specifically why. When we travel, Hmm. I don't want to lug around my Apple TV which is a set top box, Mm -hmm. but it's big, it's bulky, you know, um, it's got a a big power cable connected to it. You got to connect it to the HDMI. You got to have a a separate HDMI Mm -hmm. cable. It's a whole thing, right? Or I can buy a Chromecast dongle, which is about this big. Mm -hmm. It's teeny. Connected to the back. 
right connected to the back of whatever tv you know whether it be a hotel whether it be an airbnb mm -hmm. i can connect this chromecast to the back of the tv boom not only do i have my internet subscription live television which i currently use youtube tv now i also got apple tv and apple tv plus which i'm already paying for so and any you know, movies you have downloaded already Exactly. Any movies that I've purchased, any movies that I've, you know, uh, any movie in my library that's in the cloud, mm -hmm. I can use this smaller, more compact, more travel friendly Chromecast God, uh, dongle connected to the back of the hotel TV or Airbnb or my mama's house. When mm -hmm. we go back and we'll go back home when the outside opens back up, mm -hmm. I can take this and have my home entertainment that I'm used to wherever I go right. in a smaller, more ex less expensive package is just not google again i won't get all the benefits of the switching and all the stuff that i talked about before but for a temporary but fix it's cheaper mm -hmm. for a temporary it's temporary it's cheaper and it's easier to travel with yep and it makes sense that now that i think about it more because in the article that we're reading from mac rumors it does mention that apple tv has already the app has been rolled out to other devices including space uh playstation Xbox and Roku. So this Apple, so this Chromecast is just another, you know, device that they are rolling this software to. I think it's smart. It it keeps people, you know, it makes them feel they're giving getting a bigger bang for their buck. Yes, I'm paying for this service, but you know, if I'm out of town, if I'm, you know, someone else's, whatever the case may be, I can still use my services without having to be connected directly into the Apple ecosystem. So um, yeah, that looks like it is going to be rolled out. They didn't give a specific date, but they did mention um, early next year. So, you know, keep an eye out um, if you, um, you know, have a Chromecast or are looking to upgrade to the new Chromecast device, um, this may be an option for you. All right, let's move on to the next um, item we have in our docket this week. Um, I thought this was just interesting to note that um, currently for iOS 14, Apple um, noted that 81% of iPhones that have been introduced in the last four years, that covers a lot of devices, are running on iOS 14, 81%. So that's, uh, I don't know if that's the highest number, but that's a large percentage of users who have gone on and updated. You know, a lot of times people, I don't wanna upgrade. My iOS version works just fine. I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna break my phone. I don't wanna take the time, whatever the case may be. But for them to be running at over 80% of iPhones, you know, running the, the newest iOS that was just um, released, what, back in September? Yep, yeah, back in September. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a pretty huge win for them. That's a pretty big get for them. Right, and the way they're able to do it is, number one, they've made it easier mm -hmm. to upgrade and overcome some of those people's rejections to where you say, oh, it takes too long, I'm scared I might break my phone, I'm scared I might lose data. You know, with this whole iCloud thing to where you can back up your entire mobile device to iCloud or if you want to back it up to your computer, you know, before you needed iTunes and iTunes was big and clunky mm -hmm. in order to back up and sync your device. Now, you know, you can plug it your phone or your iPad directly to your computer, use the Finder uh, Finder app and then just quickly back up your device without uh, digging through iTunes. And of course, they since they split that out. Now it's Apple Music, and now you can use Apple Music sp specifically for music and then use your computer for everything else. So they've kind of made it easier for people to upgrade. They removed uh, people's objections to say, well, I may lose my data because everything's in the cloud now. Mm -hmm. And finally, you know, we just talked about it earlier. They're releasing all this new cool stuff that you got to upgrade mm -hmm. to. To be able to use. Yeah. So if you... Exactly. So if you're, you know, uh, somebody who's hesitated and then somebody gave you a gift of a new pair of AirPods or whatever the case may be in order to use them, you have to update. So, you know, Apple's done a good job of enticing people to upgrade 
by announcing new products, announcing new features, announcing new services that you got to be on the latest uh, uh, operating system in order to enjoy, you know, so that goes back to that whole ecosystem. Now, you know, a lot of people may feel trapped into or may, may get the impression that Apple's making me upgrade. But the trade off is you're getting some pretty cool features and it's not just a you got to upgrade just because, you know, because a lot of the issues with Microsoft and a lot of the issues, you know, they even mention that Google stopped reporting Android dis- dis- distribution numbers is because that seamless experience is not the same on a Microsoft or a Google than it is on Apple because Apple controls everything. They control the hardware, they control the software, they control the app store or the whatever ecosystem you use to download the products. And now they even control the components with this new M1, you know, chip that goes into their I their MacBooks. So they control the whole thing. So they can't pump out a better experience versus Android versus Microsoft or Google and Microsoft, even though you've got a piece of hardware from um you know, and you've got Windows software on it, you're still relying on the hardware. Same thing with Android. You may have the Android operating system, but you've got 50 million thousand brands of Android devices and it's not as seamless. Yeah. So, yeah, overall to say is that a lot of people are more comfortable, you know, upgrading. I remember back in the day, it used to be an experience. You just kind of had to sit there and hold your breath and and make sure you had a backup because you weren't sure if your device was going to get bricked or not. So I think it it says a lot to, you know, what Apple is doing from, um, you know, their their services standpoint and the, the hardware standpoint as well. All right. So the last thing that we have in the lowdown this week, um, I saw this and it, and it's going to lead, um, a little bit into, um, second string as well. But, um, we, we've been talking about Apple wool because it's been in the news and this app store and people are upset that Apple takes 30% and they think it's a monopoly. They think it's high rate robbery. Well, the EU, the European Union, they have now created a new legislation that targets Apple's, the, the app store directly. Um, and, you know, as we mentioned before, a lot of people think that the 30% that they take off top is too much. They think it's a monopoly. So what the EU has done, of course, it affects Apple, but it affects all of the other you know, tech giants as well. But I think this particular piece of legislation was done with Apple in mind. And of course, it'll trickle down to the other tech companies as well. Um, So essentially, this new legislation, they, um, they're expected to, for it to be voted on and approved fairly quickly. And it's called the Digital Markets Act. And what it will essentially do is make sure or force Apple to change, to change how the apps are in the app store. Um, and one of the things that it's, it's trying to do, um, one, as it relates to searching on the app, how you search for the app, how it shows up in the app. So that's the first thing that um, this digital markets app would, would tackle. The second thing in the legislation is that it would um, mean that Apple would have to allow users to uninstall preloaded apps. So essentially the native apps. So if you think of, you know, something small, say the clock app, you would have the the option to, to uninstall it or um, anything that comes native to the Apple app you would have you they this change is forcing they were saying that apple would have to do that i know one app in particular that um, people um, would like to get rid of is the breathe app on the apple watch even though i love the app i think it's it's very helpful um people think it's annoying but you can turn those alerts off but as of right now you can't get rid of that app and what this second part of the legislation would do would allow users to get rid of native apps, whether it's uh, a native app to Apple or a native app to Google, they would have the option to uninstall that app. 
Now, the biggest thing is that if they pass this piece of legislation and Apple or Google or any other tech company doesn't comply, they could be fined as much as 10% of the company's annual revenue that uh, for the, the, the countries that are in the European Union. And we all know how much Apple is worth. So, you know, it sounds like the EU is trying to come up on some extra cash because, you know, they're in the middle of Brexit over there in London. And, you know, it's it's pretty, you know, scary over there and the money's looking real funny in the light. So um, the, the reading from this article on 9to5Mac, the... According to the article, the digital markets app legislation was, quote, created with the goal of making practical changes instead of continuing with uh, continuing on with finding companies that continually break the law. So with all that being said, what do you think? How do you think that Apple, if this law is passed and it is approved, this legislation uh, becomes law if this digital markets app becomes law in the European Union, how do you think, you know, Apple is going to, to combat that? Uh, particularly because uh, it, it's, this is specifically for the EU, but as we know, Apple is a global company. Um, if Apple's smart, they'll comply because this is the first time the European Union has come after a big tech and won. They came after Microsoft back in the day and won against Microsoft as it relates to Internet, uh, Internet Explorer. You know, they have the EU has done a lot as far as protecting their uh, their um, citizens data, which is where the whole GDPR thing comes from. And if you're not familiar with that is anytime you go on a website now and that website pops up in a message at the bottom it says this app puts cookies on your thing except mm -hmm. uh, yes or no if you want to allow them to track that's where that came from Europe, european union um from them deciding that they were going to do more in order to protect their people their citizens data you know another thing that came from gdpr gdpr was you know a lot of people hate when not necessarily hate they're annoyed by all the email newsletters that mm -hmm. they get. Well, GDPR and Union European Union decided, hey, um, you have to tell people what you're doing with their email, what you're doing with that information. So now as a as a as a reply or as a response to that, you know, anytime you sign up with a, a newsletter and you give up your email, they have to one, let you know what they're doing with your email and two, if you opt out, they've got to have a mechanism in place to give you all your data back. You know, that's all come out of the European Union. So while this new legislation as it relates to Apple and Google um, may seem like they're picking on them, uh, this ain't the first time. And won't like be the last. Before, <laughs> it won't be the last. And like I mentioned, if Apple is smart, they will comply. Now, they may compromise and say, OK, well, we're not going to do that, but we'll do this. And then see if these, you know, if this legislation is adjusted or amended or whatever the case may be. But with the um, uh, going back with the first thing that you mentioned, self-preferencing their own apps. Like mm -hmm. if I go to the app store and type in uh, document management, you know, basically Apple, according to this thing, Apple can't put, you know, pages first which is their version of yeah. Microsoft. Yeah, they can't put their first it has to literally have to go off of, OK, well, how many people have downloaded it? You know, when was the latest update, which may not put pages first. It may put Word or it may put Google Docs or whatever other document management application first. So basically what they're saying is now y'all can't do that, which is kind of unfair. You know, if I've created this application, I've created this device that it only works on pages really doesn't work on windows or it doesn't work on google mm -hmm. pages works on apple devices mm -hmm. so it makes sense it makes sense that that would know, come they up would first. surface that would come up first but we talked about this with google you know a couple of shows ago to where google depending on what data they have on you depending on you know who you are what region what location what city all these factors me typing in a Google search term and then you typing in a Google search term, we may get two 
totally different results when the web is just supposed to be the web. So you can kind of take that same thing and kind of apply it to, you know, Apple and Google surfacing their own apps. If I type in document management, I should get the same results, no no bias, right? Mm-hmm. And Apple and Google prefacing their own apps is bias, mm-hmm. right? You, we're, we're trying to remove that, right? And then the second thing, um, allowing users to uninstall apps that, you know, originally come with their devices, Again, we've I've mentioned it before, European Union kind of went at Microsoft uh, forcing Internet Explorer as the default uh, Internet browser on Windows devices. And then Microsoft had to deal with that. So I'm not surprised that EU is going after Apple and Google for, you know, forcing them to being able to uninstall, you know, um, like like you said, any, you know, the, the the calendar app, you know, the messages app. You know, all the apps that you think come with your iPhone, you know, um, again, Apple made them. It's Apple's devices. You would think that those are the services we all we talked about the ecosystem and how everything works together. It's all in sync. You would think that would be a benefit. You know, Apple's like, well, why wouldn't you use our stuff? It all works together. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if I'm spending X amount of dollars, you know, I shouldn't have to jump through hoops. It should be easier for me to opt out of using their preferred services. So it makes sense. Again, it's, you know, it, it, it makes sense for Apple to do it, but it also makes sense for the European Union specifically, who is kind of concerned about their citizens' data more so than America. Now, if this came from, you know, the FTC or, you know, American, you know, somebody suing, you know, American company suing Apple and saying, hey, this is not fair. We know what time it is with mm-hmm. that. They're trying to come up. They're they trying to get a come up, right? Mm-hmm. Well, with the European Union, they're kind of legit when it comes to protecting their citizens' data. So it makes sense that it's coming from the European Union. They haven't lost before. So, like I said, if Apple's smart, they, they may just have to comply with this one with, or take that L. <laughs> with all of, I guess, the different companies we'll talk about shortly coming, you know, essentially after Apple specifically as it relates to the commissioning of uh, the commissions that Apple takes at 30%, do you think this could possibly be a gateway into legislation that uh, that addresses that and forces them to change their the way Everything. they do the percentages? Yeah. Um, it, it is, definitely is. So again, if Apple was smart, not only would they would comply, they would compromise, right? So they may not just say, hey, you know, we'll give in, you know, sure, we'll do all this stuff. They will try to uh, come up with alternative things that kind of serve bro- both because, you know, this is just a, even though European Union is serious, you know, companies have been able to, you know, compromise and come up with a something that doesn't hit them as hard. And like you mentioned, won't be a, you know, precedent set precedent for something else to come. You know, of course, like I said, if Apple wants to continue to do business in the European Union, you know, they'll they'll find a way to comply. But at the same time, what they don't want to do is, like you said, open up a gateway to, you know, something else to where another company can come behind them and say, okay, well, you did this. Now let's do this. And before you know it. And Apple's doing all this bending over backwards, which I'm pretty sure they don't want to do because yeah. they are an American company. Right. As love as much as we love Apple, they are a business. They yeah. are in a business to make money and they're a business to make more money and keep the money they already made. So, right. <laughs> I don't I don't see them just bending over about this. But, you know, like I said, they they I would assume they will figure out a way to work with it to where it works in Apple's favor without giving up too much, you know, to the European Union. Yep. All right. Um, that's it for second. Sh- um, blah. That's it for the lowdown this week. Uh, let's head over into second string, and you know, continuing on with this conversation around, um, you know, the App Store and you know lawsuits and you know Epic Games is you know, you know, hugely against uh, the way that Apple does its its developer type of. Um, uh, uh, commissions, um, you know, a lot of people are, are coming for Apple right now. And of course, Facebook is one of those companies we talked, um, I think last month regarding the, uh, the new privacy feature that comes with iOS 14 and, uh, Facebook mm-hmm. was not happy about that. They did like a shady little post, 
um, about it. Uh, we chuckled about it. It was, it was funny, um, to see them trying to comfort that. But in the latest saga of the privacy, uh, settings, because it affects ads and, you know, Facebook, their how they make their money is through ads and what this new, um, privacy measure or privacy feature that's in the iOS 14, it essentially lets users know who and how they will be tracked. So now Facebook has come out with full page ads in the New York times, the Washington post and the wall street journal, um, just today, which is Wednesday saying that, you know, this whole, uh, this whole new feature is detrimental. And the kicker is Apple, not Apple, but Facebook is saying that they have, you know, their qualms with this. Um, and the reason they're speaking out is to help small businesses everywhere. So I think that's the real, you know, the nerve, the audacity is you're trying to swing this as to say, it's hurting small businesses. Don't you understand you need to change this? Not mentioning the fact that predominantly all of Facebook's revenue comes from these ads. And if you're allowing users to know that if I, you know, click on this link or, or whatever the case may be, you know, who's who's going to have access to my data? All of this is going to be in full transparency now. So I wanted to get your thoughts on Apple's late, not Apple's, Facebook's latest ploy to uh, regarding this, uh, this new privacy feature on iOS 14. Even though iOS 14 is out there since, what, September, um, I guess they're saying that they what? should roll this back? Well, they n not rolled it back, but um, with iOS 14.3, which just came out this week, um, Apple has rolled out this new feature that forces applications like Facebook to literally list out all the things they do with your data, just almost like a nutrition label. You mm -hmm. know, if you're eating a, you know, whatever, you eat some food, you get to know exactly how much protein, sugar, carbohydrates, all those other names that I can't pronounce, mm -hmm. you know, what's all in your food, what percentage of it are you eating? How does this equate to your whole nutritional health? Right. So basically this is the same thing. And of course that is uncovering all the things that companies like Facebook is doing with, with your, your personal data. data. Mm -hmm. Apple is big on protecting your personal data. They've put out commercials. They put out all these things to say, Hey, if you're using an Apple device, we are not collecting your data. We're not harvesting it. We're not manipulating it. We're not selling it to anybody. We're generally using the information we collect to better your experience. Mm -hmm. And we, and it's anonymized. It's not, we, we're not then using it to all these things that Facebook does because Facebook, they need, and specifically the small businesses that advertise on Facebook which is why Facebook is putting out this plea to small businesses, because the way you f advertise on Facebook is by targeting people based off their personal data, mm -hmm. where they live, how old they are, who their connections are, where they shop, what they like, how much they spend, they how much they spend, what they've bought, what they've looked at, all these things that people complain about when you <laughs> think about something and then you open up Facebook and it's all in your Facebook news feed. That's because at Facebook has done an excellent job of collecting and harvesting all this data and then turn around and present it in a pretty nice bow to Facebook advertisers and say, look, we've collected all this personal data. If you want to sell your products, you need to advertise with us because then we can give you all of this data. So Facebook now is saying, oh, well, since we have to tell Apple users that we're collecting all this data, Apple users may say, nah, I ain't trying to mess with that. And then that's less data for advertisers, Facebook to then sell to small business mm -hmm. users. So um, basically what Facebook is saying is, hey, small business users, users, we need you to help us keep your data so we can then sell it back to you so you can make money off of this data that we've collected. And we can make you. even more. Yeah. 
Yeah. I just, yeah, I just think it's very funny, even though I think it, I guess time will tell how smart it is for them to kind of take themselves out of the equation and saying, look, at we're this big tech company. We're advocating for the small guy, the little guy. We're advertising. We're advocating for you, small business owner, who are selling your goods on Facebook. If this continues, then you may not make as much money. And in the time of COVID and, you know, just being a small business in general, it's hard for them to to make money to sustain their their company or their product. They're always looking for different ways to to increase their revenue. I just I just find it very off putting. There's another word that I want to use. I can't think of it right now that Facebook is taking this approach when they are currently being sued for, you know, privacy and data related leaks and and issues and we all know we all remember Cambridge Analytica you know just a short time ago so I just find it very interesting that they've chosen this angle and they've chosen to say hey we need more people on our side so let's pander to these small businesses to get them on our side right they're they're like hey small businesses help us fleece regular people for their personal data so we can sell it back to you so you and us can make a bunch of money right i'm like i don't know if small businesses really want to do it that way of course they know people are on facebook and go where the people are so let me advertise on facebook because that's where two billion plus people are Mm -hmm. but i don't think small businesses maybe they do and don't care right but i don't know if they they understand that by fully integrating with Facebook, you are harvesting people's personal data. Now, it's public data because we go on Facebook and we publish all this information, Mm -hmm. but let's not pretend you're doing a solid by, you know, uh, you're not, you're somehow pleading for small business to help protect people's data. Let's, let's keep it a hundred. Yeah. Keep it a buck. You're asking small business, right. You're asking small businesses to help us continue taking people's data by uh, jumping on this bandwagon against Apple, who these big bad people, how dare they protect their users' data? That's just crazy. <laughs> right. When a lot of these same business owners are Apple users and they run their business from Apple devices, I don't think they're going to get the kind of traction they are shooting for. But at this point, I think they are just kind of like all out of options. So they're just like, let's throw this against the wall and see you and know, what we'll get. And they're being petty because Apple, Tim Cook last week or the week before kind of lashed out against Facebook and other companies about data. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is kind of like Mark Zuckerberg's, you know, jab back to, you know, uh, Apple by appealing to all these small businesses that make all this money off of Facebook mm-hmm. when really they're not really making money off Facebook. They're making Facebook money off money. the data yeah. that Facebook collects and then sells to people. So they're, you know, like you said, keep it, keep, be honest, mm-hmm. keep it a hundred, tell them what you're actually doing actually and then do see it. if they are still on board. Right. <laughs> I just thought it was very funny, very interesting to say the least. All right, let's pop into the next story. Um, so Microsoft, they have updated all of their, um, apps for office for Mac, um, that now supports Apple Silicon, um, also iCloud accounts and Outlook and a couple of other things. So, um, we, we've mentioned before that Apple has rolled out its M1, um, Mac devices, uh, uh, laptops and, um, you know, not all of the apps that you currently use are currently configured to be able to run on this new M1 chip. Microsoft was like, hold on one second. We realized that a lot of people use Office for Mac. So um, mm-hmm. what they've done is they have released new versions for most of their um, Office 365 um, for, for Mac products that will now run natively on the M1 chip Laptops. So this means Outlook, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote um, will all work on the new um, M1 uh, chip device. Um, so Microsoft is 
definitely like don't leave us out you can you can still use your software when you go over please don't forget about us don't use keynote or pages we will work on your new devices as well so you can still use them so um one, right yeah. and micro go ahead no you go for it no i was gonna say microsoft has pretty much you know um warmed up to the idea that they're going to be a continue to be a subscription based company and they're going to do the best that they possibly can at it and even some cases better than apple can specifically word powerpoint excel OneNote, teams OneDrive, so on and so forth mm -hmm. you can make the case that those products work way better than apple's work products pages numbers keynote, keynote. Well, section keynote a lot of people like keynote keynote powerpoint they're kind of one in the same but all the other things you know aren't too many people don't like the default calendar app for Mac or Apple. They don't like the default mail app. You know, a lot of people would rather prefer Outlook, which handles all of your emails and calendars and so on and so forth in the same type of uh, collaboration environment that they do Office 365 to manage their email accounts, to manage all the documents and everything like that. So Apple, I mean, Microsoft rather said, we see what's coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and make our software as friendly as possible. So regardless of what device you use, whether it be an Apple, whether it be an Android, whether it be a Windows machine, whether it be a Chrome Chromebook, our products work everywhere and you get the same experience because that wasn't always the case. Right. You know, you could get Office, you could get Office 2011 for Mac, but it'd be this low budget stepchild from uh, Word, PowerPoint, Excel that you would find on a Windows machine. They've kind of kind of threw that out. Yeah. To where it's like, look, they're as robust as awesome. if you use it on a Microsoft machine. Right, because they want to continue having people pay for that subscription. You pick whatever device you want, use our subscription, put it on your device, and then boom. So it makes sense. And and as, as an added bonus, like I mentioned before, the fact that they do their products even better than um, Apple for. Uh, in addition to this, you know, well, embedded in this story, um, iCloud accounts will be compatible with I, uh, Microsoft Outlook. Mm -hmm. So if I have a, you know, Apple iCloud email address, I can put that into Outlook mm -hmm. and get my Apple email via my iCloud account within Outlook mm -hmm. because I'm used to using business and personal all that through Office 365. Let me pull in that as well. So like I mentioned before, Microsoft sees where they're going, see where things are going. We love our Apple products, but let's see if we can hitch our wagon to the to the ride and make sure all of our devices are compatible, regardless of what device you pick up. Right. And one of the other things that it notes in the account as well, that the Outlook for Mac, which you can now use your iCloud account on, they've redesigned it so it looks like uh, Big Sur. So they are taking mm -hmm. it a step further to make sure that it's more integrated in what Big Sur looks like. Because as we mentioned before, Apple products, they are essentially lining all of them up, iOS, uh, Mac OS, and um, iPad OS with these uh, to make them seamless and look the same across all of your devices. Um, it looks like they've updated the Office Start experience for what Word, Excel, all of you know those suites um, for Mac. It's a better UI design, um, and there are a couple of other you know new things that they've they've thrown in as well. So yeah, it looks like Microsoft is like yeah we have our subscription service as well. Let's keep the subscription going because we know a large number of people use Mac and we know that our, you know, software is better. So let's keep, let's not lose these folks um, when we can still get that money. Yep. All right. And the next thing we have to come to talk about, um, we talked about, you know, uh, the election in um, the pre-show a bit. But what it seems is that uh, who is it the the chief the C the CISA the chief cyber person um, was fired by Trump a couple of months ago um, the uh, and the the head of 
um, I can't, I'm trying to remember the, the department, uh, I don't think it was, was it CIA? Shoot, now I can't remember. Anyway, one of the other top leaders, uh, uh, secretary cabinet positions was um, resigned or fired. You can, can't keep up with so much going on with coming and going in the administration. But essentially what this is, currently with the administration that we have, we do not have officials in place that are protecting our our infrastructure, that aren't protecting our our security as it relates to to cyber related, um, you know, uh, uh, the word I'm looking for is is completely skipping my brain. But the the cyber security that we have for the nation, our security, not talking about you know from invasions on the war front, but we're talking about cyber um, attempts. Well, apparently um, the government uses solar winds and this company, I actually saw this story, um, the, one of the authors was on one of the MSNBC shows and apparently there was a big Russian hack and it gave um, these Russian hackers what they're calling godlike um, access to essentially every, uh, every department in the, in the government, treasury department, uh, uh, the commerce department, um, homeland security, you know, pretty much the people that are supposed to keep us safe, they have been infected and, the Russians have gotten into essentially all of our intelligence through this company, SolarWinds. And what it looks like it boils down to is this company, not only for you know the US government, but all the companies who use this particular company, they have been exposed and it goes deep. So essentially, what happened was there was a patch update. If you run the update, you give the Russians backdoor access into your system. So God knows what they have access to, but if they have this godlike access, they pretty much have everything. Um, I think it's going to take a significant amount of time to determine exactly what um was accessed and in the article that I'm reading from the New York Times who originally wrote the story, 18,000 private and government users downloaded the Russian, you know, Trojan horse or backdoor access when they updated with this patch. And I was reading somewhere else, I'm not sure if it's in this particular article, I've, I've been very intrigued by this. Um, the password apparently was solar winds one two three <laughs> so this company that has eighteen thousand high level uh clients have now essentially given access to the russians um the russian intelligence community and it has to be the article indicates you know, it's one of the most embarrassing breaches um, that came um, at the Pentagon, Department of Homeland Security. Um, and it's NSA. just out there. NSA, it's just, it's out there. I mean, who knows what they are privy to? And if they have right. this access, I'm, I'm assuming they have access to everything. And how are they going to use this, particularly when we're in a period of transition of power from one party to the other, when the current party doesn't want to share or play nice to make sure it's a smooth transition. So these next, what, 36 days um, that Trump remains in office, this is the peak time for some sort of massive, you know, cyber attack on the country. Well, so 
it's clear that with this current administration's unwillingness to really announce Russia as a serious threat. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen all the things with Donald Trump kind of avoiding directly targeting uh, Putin as a, you know, foe, you know, not to say that Russia is a foe, but we know on how Trump got into office with the whole Cambridge Analytica and selling information to Russian companies who then used it to influence social media, which kind of started the whole fake news thing in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. That's some people are making that to say, well, that's how Trump got elected because these Russian people with all this information so dissent in so through social media which stopped people from voting, painted Hillary Clinton in some sort of way. But our emails. emails. Yeah. Right, right. That's where, you know, we even have Trump on tape saying, I hope Russia has, or WikiLeaks rather, has access to so on and so forth, you know, which the, the guy kind of defected to Russia, whatever the case may be. We know this administration has been lax on Russia. As a result, the improper, the, 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 the proper people in the heads of these military and security uh, departments were not there, either if either they were not there or they were there and really didn't take the job seriously or the threat seriously because the president didn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. So as a result, things got lax. And now this New York Times story says, now we know what the Russians were after because everything was so lax. Mm -hmm. So again, like you mentioned, we don't know what they have access to. We don't know what they obtained. We don't know what they still have access to. We don't know what they even plan to do with it. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of the story is if we wasn't so lax on Russia, something like this could happen and it has. So now the question is, what do we do about it? What is this administration going to do about it? Probably not a lot. Now, what, extra weight is on the incoming administration's hands to clean this up because yeah. you know even though you've seen vladimir putin uh say you know publicly i'm willing to work with oh, uh, uh president uh president like biden and the incoming administration now they've got this whole other fog thing that they have to deal with which, again, is not helping anybody. Like like I mentioned, we don't know what they're going to do with it. We don't know if they're going to do anything mm -hmm. with it. But the fact that this current administration was so lax, why not take a shot and dig in there and see what we can find? Yeah. We Who knows what they found? Who knows what they're going to do? But, again, that just goes back to the fact that the fact that they had this access because this administration was kind of lax when it came to their right. relationship with Russia. Yeah. And, what it, and what it really says to me is that, you know... One of the, you know, ramifications of this is that the country, if the country is attacked with some sort of massive cyber attack and two, which is what was one of my, that was one, one of my, your predictions um, at the predictions. beginning of the year, you still have what, what, 15, 15, 14 days. Mm -hmm. Um, and the mm -hmm. other thing is, unfortunately we have to think of the political ramifications. So say there is some huge cyber attack. Who do you think they're going to blame for this? They're going to blame the Biden-Harris administration, even though this happened on their watch. They are going to spin the heck out of this to right. say it wasn't us. But reading a little bit further down into the article, it was one particular piece of software that the hackers put their um, their their code in, and it's the Orion software. Um, this is based, uh, um, apparently they said that of their 300,000 customers that use Orion, probably about 10%, just over 10% use this particular software. Um, and only half of those 33,000 downloaded the update. But what they're saying is that the, this is from uh, FireEye uh, Vice President. He said, quote, we think the number who were actually compromised were in the dozens, but they were all the highest value targets. So not everybody right. was targeted. So it hit a bunch of people, but they were probably only interested in treasury, 
Homeland Security, Pentagon, CIA, NSA. Those were probably the dozen or so people that they were looking. They don't care about these other private companies and what they have going on. Whatever. We don't care about y'all. You just unfortunately uh, a, a side effect, uh, so to speak. But who they were going after, they got who they were targeting. And these are departments that have highly classified information. And the issue is, like you mentioned, what are we going to do about it? Likely nothing. So in between this time of the, the power, the transfer of power, the question is, if you have, say, in the CIA, a list of all of the names, locations of, you know, bunkers or black sites or whatever you see in the spy shows, do they have enough time to hit all of those sites? And do, do they have like a mitigation plan for something like this? Knowing this current administration, probably not. Other administrations probably did have contingency plans in case these type of things are compromised. But I think it's the volume of what is compromised and you don't know what all was compromised. So you have to essentially run your mitigation plan on everything. And I don't think this current administration is doing that. Nope. So it's, it's really scary um, to think, you know, the worst case scenario that could happen with this. Um, and we know that Russia and Putin, they play chummy chummy with Trump, but at the end of the day, they are all about their own business. They just realize they have a sucker in him that they can, you know, say some nice words and pretend to be friends all the same time, you know, not here for him or stab him in the back or whatever the case may be. So I just think the relationship, as you mentioned, that the president, uh, the current president, the outgoing president has with Russia um, has seriously hindered us. And I think people have said that from the very beginning, but there was nothing really tangible other than what we know as far as the hacking to get him elected um, has done. So if Russia can usurp a, an American election and get an unqualified man, um, in office, imagine what they could do with this type of information. So I think it's just really, it's really nerve wracking and it's really, you know, quite, um, quite, uh, scary as to, to what can, can happen. So all we can do is say a prayer and, and hope it kind of works out. All right. All right. All right, that is it for Second String. Let's head on over to For the Culture. So um, we have a couple things this week to talk about. One kind of light and fun, and the other one fairly serious. Let's start with the serious so we can end the show on, on a funny high note. Um, on Monday, the first um, vaccine for COVID was administered right here in the United States, well, the United, the first one in the United States. Um, it was the, the Pfizer um, version of the coronavirus vaccine. It was uh, um, <clears throat> a black nurse um, in Queens who was the first person inoculated with the virus. Since then, the virus has rolled out to multiple um, states, starting with frontline workers, uh, meaning those in hospitals, um, elderly, you know, folks to get them um, vaccinated first since they are the most vulnerable. Um, there's a second um, vaccination from Moderna um, that is expected to be approved and rolled out um, soon. They, have, they don't have an exact date, but uh, it looks like everything is in place for that to roll out. So um, the particular nurse who um, got the first inoculation, uh, Sandra Lindsay, a uh, critical nurse, a critical care nurse um, at the Long, Northwell Long Island Jewish Medical Center, 
um, was was inoculated there. It was a live streamed event so that everyone could see it. I think a lot of it is transparency, uh, making sure that everyone kind of sees it visually. It wasn't lost on me and I think anybody. It was a very calculated measure, it seems, to have a black woman not only receive the vaccination, but it was administered by a black woman as well because as we know, most of the, a high percentage of the black population is not keen on receiving this vaccination. Um, This particular nurse was on a Joy Reid show and she talked about her experience and she gave her thoughts on what the vaccine will do. She was very positive. She was very excited that we now have this vaccine. Um, So does this, uh, I guess, ease your concerns any about the vaccine? No. <laughs> and and because, and tr- without getting into long-winded about this, um, like you said, it's not missed on anybody that a black nurse administered the first step of this vaccine to a black uh, a, uh, a black nurse, you know, so we know that not only which, again, is just another another notch on the belt of African Americans comp- complex uh, history in America that not only does the coronavirus disproportionately affect, way more African Americans and minorities than the average white person. Now, when this new vaccine has come about, the first people who they want to show trust the vaccine are black people and African Americans. Not because, not, let me not say not because, not only because we are disproportionately affected by the coronavirus, but also because of our history with America, specifically with the government and, and with healthcare, <laughs> right? And vaccines specifically, specifically, right? yeah. You know, we, you know, a lot of people I've seen say, you know, well, have you? Do you know? You know, it. What? Let me let me rephrase. Let me paint the picture first. When somebody says, "I don't trust the vaccine," you know, a lot of people their response is, "Well, have you seen? Or do you know?" Or have you been directly affected with COVID or know somebody who's been affected or somebody who's died, you know, as into kind of not shame, but like low key guilt Mm -hmm. people into trusting this vaccination. And my response to that is, do you know America's true history with black Americans as it relates to health care? You know, you can go back as you know, recently the 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 whistle has been blown on black women's care when it become when it comes to pregnancy, mm-hmm. when it comes to cancer. You know how their feelings have been ignored, their thoughts have been ignored, and as a result, all these different ailments, all these different things have affected black people, black women specifically, disproportionately. That's just recent news. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about. Henrietta Lacks, Mm -hmm. you know, they used her stem cells to create all the things that we probably take for granted today. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the Tuskegee experiment that specifically experimented on black men by infecting them with syphilis. And then when the um, when the not the cure, uh, what's the thing? Penicillin. Mm -hmm. When Penicillin was developed as a result of the uh, studies done on these people by injecting them with uh, unknowingly, syphilis. they was right. And knowingly, they wasn't given access to the penicillin that they developed as a result of experimenting on them. So add that up with all the other things that African Americans have been through in their history with America and what we're going through right now <laughs> and what we're going through right now with the pandemic you black can't, being murdered you have to respect right now I'm, I'm not even counting all the other stuff right you know just with health care mm-hmm. right you add all of that up and i don't understand why people don't understand our skepticism when it comes to this vaccine now i applaud this lady i applaud this nurse 
I applaud all the people who are on the front lines. I have compassion for the people who are proactive in wanting to take this vaccine, probably because they've been affected directly. And they see directly what's COVID. happened. Yeah. I, I understand completely. Mm-hmm. But you, on the flip side, have to understand that a lot of us are skeptic when it comes to this vaccine. At the very least, you know, I, I'll speak for myself personally, you know, the fact that they rushed this back seemingly, I don't want to say seemingly because I don't want to say this is what happened for sure. And I know for a fact and I've done research because I haven't. But seemingly they have rushed this vaccine as a bailout because we can't do the things we're supposed to do in order to turn this pandemic around. Mm-hmm. So it be, it's it's in that rushing, seemingly or allegedly rushing this pandemic out there, you could make the argument that there wasn't enough research done. They could have taken some more time. The reason why they couldn't take any more time to do research, do all extra tests, do all this extra stuff is because this pandemic is growing so much because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. We're not so staying inside. Like, we're not wearing masks. I not, mean, basic things. It, there shouldn't even be a need for a vaccine if people would just listen to scientists and not have to force these scientists to come up with a vaccine in nine months. I mean, that's right. that's not, that's not it. Years, right. Not five months, not after thousands and thousands of tests have been conducted. Nine months. And the reason why, because they had to bail us out. So mm-hmm. anytime you have to bail somebody out, anytime you have to rush, the lesson is not learned. No. So as and then so and then to to like you said, to add that up, you know, um, a lot of people don't feel like there has been enough time to test this thing. So all that to say, there are people like me who say, I'll eventually take the vaccine. Number one, when the numbers go down. Number two, when there's more research and more results that come from this first batch. Mm -hmm. Now, when the second batch roll out, you know, if beta version, you know, Mm COVID-19.2 releases for my iPhone and my iPad (laughs) and my Mac, (laughs) then I'll update, I'll update, you know, and take the vaccination with that after You've done more research, but I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do and Mm -hmm. stay safe, stay inside, socially distance, stick, get mad, you know, mask up if I must go out, only go out if we must, not taking trips, not traveling, not visiting friends and family, not having people over. That is the only way I know to protect myself and my family Mm -hmm. and not necessarily put them at risk of the, the COVID pandemic and risk of the possible vaccine that was rushed because we can't do what we're supposed to do. I think that's all people are saying. I I mean, yes, you can say there are some people, black people specifically, that say, I ain't taking this vaccine at all. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there's some people out there like that. I I think most people, knowing the ravaging that this uh, pandemic has done, I think most people say, I don't necessarily have a problem with a vaccine. I just kind of have a problem with this vaccine Mm. right now. Right. Give it some time, do some more tests, figure out what the results and the side effects are because there's all all, already some rumblings going around about this vaccine and complications with Bell's palsy. I'd have to do more research. I don't want to throw anything out there. I just kind of kind of heard and maybe Mm -hmm. seen some things, but all that to say, I think people are in a wait and see mode. Mm-hmm. I'm going to stay inside and then I'm going to wait and see. When the numbers come down, when there's more tests, more things have been conducted, then we can talk. But right now, too soon. Right. And speaking for me personally, I've been reading some things about this. And one uh, of the things that one person brought up is that the H1N1 vaccine was done in five months. Um, so... Based on where we are, I'm feeling more comfortable with the vaccine, primarily because Trump was not involved. That was my biggest thing is I'm not taking anything that Trump was involved in. The fact that Moderna, Pfizer, and all these other companies did not take any of the warp speed money, he had, they were clear to say, we don't know him, bro. 
we don't right. we don't we don't know you um so that was one of the things that you know made me feel a little bit better about the vaccine the second thing is the moderna version was um created and led the the creation of it was led by a black woman uh dr kismika um oh shoot i'm messing up i i think it's is it uh cole bear shoot i don't want to and i had it in my head um i think she's dr kizzy mz md or dr kizzy phd on twitter but corbett i'm sorry there it is. they came back to me um dr um Kismika Corbett, um, she is leading up the team that created that vaccine. So that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, the third thing that makes me feel a little bit better is I'm at the very end of the list of people who will get this vaccine because I'm healthy, I'm young, I don't have pre any pre-existing conditions, I'm not an essential worker. So by the time the vaccine gets to me, it'll probably be 2022. And that gives me, you know, a year and a half to kind of see where this thing is going for them to work out the kinks. So I will, I, I will take the vaccine. Um, right. But at the same time, by the time it gets to me, we will have some more data to make that final decision. But based on where we are right now and based on what we know, I am not opposed to taking the vaccine because of those three mm-hmm. things that I mentioned. Right, right. And, and congratulations to the sister doctor. I get it. I see the lady on the camera and they was all, you know, doing around. I get it. I respect it. And I respect anybody who is, like you mentioned, you know, been affected directly by it or has pre-existing conditions, you know, or is a frontline worker or a healthcare worker or whatever. Or, you know, even if they are not, you know, frontline or not, preconceived notions they have been in the you know in the trenches mm-hmm. and they see and they see the, the, right i get it yeah i get it completely but you see know, i can um, stay home <laughs> i can social <laughs> distance i can wear a mask so that mm-hmm. makes me feel better about the whole thing because i know if i don't get the vaccine i'm taking all the other steps to not get the coronavirus mm-hmm. So for those right. people who have to be outside, who have to be around other sick people, who have a, these essential jobs where they have to be outside, I completely 100% see why they are like, yes, you know, beat me up, Scotty, you know, stick me in the arm because I want this vaccine because I've seen what it can do to people. And they are so much more exposed. So I get it. Um, I definitely think this is a step in the right direction. I'm cautiously optimistic about the outlook for it. And I hope it Mm -hmm. definitely does work. But one of the things that they said is this isn't the cure all. Even if you have the vaccine, you still need to social distance. You still need to wear your mask. You need still need to stay indoors. If we're not doing it before the vaccine, this, I think this will give people the uh the mindset of oh i'm invincible now i got the vaccine i can do whatever i want and i'm untouchable and we all know that that's not the case but people think they're invincible now so imagine if all these people black and white take this vaccine and just assume that they can go out and do whatever you know so if that's going to happen which it will well i assume that's going to happen anyway why, you know, um, you have to excuse me if I'm not trying to bump up to the front of the line to take this vaccine when the the, the pandemic is not going to go down anyway because people can't do what they're going to do. So on top of that, now I've got this potentially, you know, this vaccine that hasn't been run through, run through the, you know, run has more data and done more research. So, you know, all that to say, you know, I... I just want people to recognize and understand and don't just flippantly dismiss people when they say, I am skeptic of this vaccine. That doesn't necessarily mean they admonish anybody who is going to take it. That doesn't necessarily mean that they themselves aren't going to take it. Just recognize why and understand and respect at the very least why 
they have questions and concerns and they are skeptic because there is a history behind it. Yeah. It's not just tinfoil hat you know, 5G is going to take over and no. it's just another way for the government to control us. No, it's, it's based in fact. Relax. Yeah. It's based in fact and it's based in history. Mm -hmm. So just, rec just recognize game when people say, eh, I don't know about that. It ain't just them just saying it. Yeah, because what we're seeing a lot of are people who are proponents of the vaccine. I mean, black people and all, because I've seen, you know, plenty of black people saying, as soon as it's available for me, I'm going to get it. And I what I don't like is the people saying, well, if you, um, if you, uh, you know, don't take it, you know, that's not smart. That's not stupid. I've, I've heard the jokes and, you know, about if, if you've had, uh, if you've drank, you know, the Hulk drink or whatever that is, I don't know. I didn't drink that in college or whatever. Or if you've drank, you know, out of the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the hunch punch at, you know, whatever fraternity party, you should take it. And it's all jokes and it, and it is funny, but at the same time, you know, people are giving credence to it. And, and I get it, you know, we expose ourselves to a lot of different things, but I think in this particular case, over 300,000 people have died from, mm -hmm. from this virus. And like I said, you know, before I'm, I plan on taking the vaccine, Fortunate for me, I don't have to be in a rush to take it because I'm so low on the priority list that by the time it gets available to me, you know, we'll have a little bit more, you know, data behind it and seeing, you know, how people respond to it, I think will ease a lot of people's fears as well. So I don't think people are opposed to the vaccine just for the sake of being opposed to it. I just think they need a little bit more, you know, solid background on it before they agree to take it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yep. So, all right. The, the last thing that I wanted to talk about in for the culture, um, it's been on black Twitter for the last week or so, apparently on December 21st, all black people are going to get their superpowers. So what? it's, yeah. So it's explain this. Cause so, I'm, yeah. I read it in a doc and I'm like, I'm just going to let you lead and <laughs> tell me where this is going. Right. So on Twitter, I don't know who started it or who came up with it, but they started saying that December 21st is when it's going to activate the superpower DNA in all black people. And of course it's been memes, it's been jokes and people are talking about, you know, which superpower they hope they get, or if they want to be a, a villain or a hero. And of course the memes have been funny. The jokes have been funny. And, um, you know, I originally thought, you know, it was just somebody just, you know, how Twitter is, something goes viral, all black Twitter stars talking about it and laughing about it. And then the article that we'll put in the show notes came up. So apparently on December 21st, 21st, two, the two largest planets are supposed to nearly collide. They're supposed to get as close as possible in history or whatever. And these planets, if you don't know, are Jupiter and Saturn. They are supposed to come together. I'm not sure if they're supposed to actually touch, um, but they're supposed no. to be so, so close in orbit this. that it's... Let me read this. From our vantage point on Earth, the huge gas giants will appear very close together, but they will remain hundreds of millions <laughs> of miles apart in space. So <laughs> while it'll probably look pretty, <laughs> I don't think it's going to activate any mutant genes <laughs> in black people, but you know, leave it to black folks and their imaginations and their thirst right. for uh, the impossible. Right. I just thought it was really funny <laughs> because they were, I mean, I don't know if you've been on Twitter, but it's been about a week that people have been talking about this. And then the article that we're reading from is from NASA. So it's coming from NASA. And I think when I saw the article on Twitter, it was from a different source. And I was like, let me go and find out from the real people if this is true or not about these two planets. But, um, you know, 
we know we're not getting superpowers, <laughs> but someone put it out there that December 21st, black people were getting their, their superpowers. And it just kind of spiraled into these, these tweets and memes. And it's just been a light, you know, fun thing on, on Twitter, which we know can be a cesspool. And, you know, I just want to bring a little bit something light and funny to, to the show. We're both uh, Marvel fans and we're, we're in the culture of that. So I just thought it was really, really funny. Um, how, uh, how this whole thing came about. And then when someone posted, you know, after we've been talking a week about December 21st, this whole Mm -hmm. two planets coming together deal in an event, it's called, it's an astro astronomical event. And it has a name with these two planets coming. So close, so close. And you know, that's in quotes, if you can't see me, um, close for, for us but not close in reality because these planets are millions of miles away. It's called the Great Conjunction. Um, so it's it's going to be very pretty for us to see. Um, and it's already happening. Um, it's just that the 21st is the peak of, of this event. Yeah, so I did some digging on Twitter and I found the, the threads and there are some that I can't mention mm-hmm. on this show but <laughs> let's Family just show. say it has, it has to do with you know uh the color you know your your melanin tone <laughs> and whether or not what level of superpowers you're gonna get so oh I, really I it's based on it, your but, it's based on your melanin content which um superpowers you're gonna well get? according to yeah according to this one you know people who are fair skinned uh, may not get the same level of power. So <laughs> that's the inside joke there that again, I'll, I'll leave alone the, the, the real version on this, but right. uh, it's just, it's just pretty funny how the links of Twitter will go to yeah. entertain themselves, right. put it like that. <laughs> and I was very entertained and seeing all the memes pop up. I saw some today popping up, you know, it's getting closer and closer. And it was like, I think the last one I saw, it was like, they had like, Blank man, then they had like, was it black lightning? So they had like the quote unquote tiers of super heroes. And it's like, so some of y'all are gonna get blank man, and some of y'all are gonna get Black Panther. It's not all equal. And I didn't really dig down into it to see what it was, but I just thought it was very funny. And someone did um they did the the heroes, the the show heroes they redid the the logo from that show to say Negroes. And I about died because it was so funny. But, you know, finding Twitter, Twitter is good for, for, for some things and, and finding brevity and uh, le- uh, bright spots and, and levity to, you know, otherwise, you know, treacherous situations is, is one of the things that I really love Twitter for is because it it really can can make you laugh. And this was something that has made me laugh over the last week or so. So um, if anybody is interested, you know, do your Twitter Googles and do your Twitter searches and you can you can definitely find, you know, some of the posts and memes and, and pictures about it and, and get yourself a chuckle too. Some of our uh, less melanated um, friends and, and all out there may not get all the jokes, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for those of our who have a higher melanin content, uh, go and, and enjoy the, the laughs. All right. That is it. And for the culture, unless you had anything you want to talk about this week that you saw out and about on these internet streets? Uh, no. No. Uh, we're also... Uh, running kind of long on this show, so oh, yeah. I'm gonna probably skip the hookup as well. I'm gonna save that one for next week. Okay. So, but that's all I got. Okay. Oh wow, I didn't realize we had talked this long. All right. So yes. Yeah, so um, we will skip the hookup uh for this week. Other than I do have one, a quick one. When you're about to use a piece of software, whether you're going live, whether you're presenting, do not update it before. <laughs> you need to use it. If you were on our pre-show, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So my hookup is do your updates the day before you need to use them or after you're done using them. Right. Um, right. To ensure that 
your software works accordingly and it does not put your system into a, a dragging state where you have to do a hard <laughs> reset on your machine to get it back up and running. So that's my, right. <laughs> that's my hookup for this week. All right. So that's it for this week. Definitely download, rate, and review us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Definitely don't forget to engage with us on social media. Um, we are at Snob OS Cast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Definitely be sure to watch our show on YouTube. We're at Snob OS Cast. Definitely uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Also, you can leave us comments and suggestions at our website, snobwestcast.com, or feel free to shoot us over an email. Our email address is snobwestcast at gmail.com. Again, you too can become a patron um, of our show by going to patreon.com slash snobwestcast. And for $5 a month, you can get access to our pre-show content, access to our live show taping, and also access to our discourse live chat. Next week is Christmas, so I hope you all get all of your shopping done if you're like me and still have so much to do. Um, Mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, that's it for this week. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Peace.